Well, hello, and thanks for tuning in to our online service. My name is Ryan McDonald, and I'm the music director for the Refuge Campus. Before we move into a time of worship, just a few announcements for us. First, we offer three in-person gatherings, all of which happen on Sundays. Two are in the morning at 9 and 11 a.m., and one is in the evening at 5 p.m. If you're interested in attending any of these, you need to sign up and you can do so either through our website online or you can use the link that's found in the loop. There's gonna be limited Grace Kids classes offered for kids from the ages of birth to the fifth grade. If you're interested in that, there's more information to be found in the loop. Speaking of the loop, the loop is our weekly email that we send out with lots of good information, things about the fall family fun event or how to partner with Hope Clinic, lots of other good things like that. If you're interested in being in the loop, you can sign up for that e-newsletter at graceatude.org slash loop. Finally, at Grace, we consider giving an act of worship. If you are interested in giving here, you can do so on our website at graceatude.org slash give or therefugechurch.org slash give. Or you can write a check to our Maple Campus at 1300 South Maple Road, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Before we move into the rest of our worship service, let's spend a moment in prayer. Father, we offer this time to you wherever we are, however we're watching this, with whoever we are with. We pray that you would speak to us in this time, whatever that is, and that you would make us more like you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.
how did the Gladiator games end? Gladiator games were wildly popular in ancient Rome in the first couple centuries, the same time when the early church was getting underway. Oftentimes, the gladiator games would pit two individuals against one another in single combat. Sometimes the gladiator games were replays of famous battles between whole teams. Sometimes the gladiator games were hunts, hunts where people would hunt animals or animals would hunt people. Oftentimes, these games were a matter of life and death, very different than our sports where we want and assume everybody's gonna go home safely and be able to come back and play again the next week. Now, the gladiators themselves, a lot of money was invested in them. They were, they were slaves, but they were also competitors, and so for their rich benefactors, they didn't necessarily want their gladiator to die, but it wasn't unusual for a gladiator to die. Many of us have seen popular depictions. We even have a, an image here, a very famous painting from a painter with the last name Jerome, uh, which was in the mid 1800s that he made this painting. And this, what would happen at the end of these games was that these gladiators, not like in the painting where he's sort of looking up to the emperor, but if it was single combat and one gladiator was laying on the ground in blood and mire and all the nastiness and the other one had his weapon at his throat or pointed at him, he would look to an editor or a referee who would decide then what to do with his vanquished foe, whether or not he should kill him or let him live. Now, scholars have disagreed over the years on what the signal was. In the movies, it's always like, yeah, you're alive or like, you're dead or something like that. But some scholars have actually suggested that they would wave a hanky or that they would pinch their fingers together to say, you know, let them live kind of thing, which seems like a strange signal to me, but that's what they did. It was that person's life was in the hands of another for that moment, for that one little signal. We are in week four of our five part series on we the people, looking at the preamble and the constitution, not of the United States, but of the kingdom of God. And we've been talking about how during this time, this time which is so much about right and left, not how can we be centrist, but how can we be transcendent? How can we be part of this kingdom of God as true citizens, embracing the values of Christ, not just the values of this world? So week one, we said, blessed are the poor in spirit, the salt and light of the world. Week two, blessed are the peacemakers, not simply the peacekeepers. Week three, blessed are the meek, whether they're strong or weak, blessed are the meek. And today we're going to talk about a virtue that you may deduce from the popularity of the gladiator games was not necessarily something that was highly valued in Greek Roman culture, but it's something that Jesus lifted up. In Matthew 5 verse 7, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Today we're gonna to talk about mercy and what it means to be merciful. And we're gonna break this up into three sections. One, where we try to define what mercy is. What is mercy? Secondly, we're gonna talk about what it means to be mercy filled. And then thirdly, what it means to be merciful. All right, so let's start with mercy. What is mercy? The Bible describes God as a God of mercy. In fact, God's mercy is one of the major themes throughout the Bible. All through the Old Testament and the New Testament, you can find passages where it talks about God's mercy. Here's just a few of them. Exodus 34, 6. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Psalm 86. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Psalm 145, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Ephesians 2, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. 1 Peter 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Many of the texts that describe God's mercy describe it and connect it to forgiveness. Forgiveness. 
and not giving something the, what they deserve. When, when I was growing up, I was taught that, that grace and mercy are different. Mercy, which is helios, uh, which is not giving some, someone something bad that they deserve, and charis, which is grace, which is giving somebody something good which they do not deserve. So the illustration that I was taught in Sunday school was you're in your car and you're driving along and you're speeding and all of a sudden a police officer pulls behind you and he pulls you over and you know that that he's got you busted. You definitely were speeding. You deserve to get a ticket. And so you're trying to think up your excuse and what am I going to do to get out of this ticket as you watch him in the rear view approaching the car. And as he comes up to the to your door, your window, and he begins to lean towards you, you, you start to want to make excuses for what you just did. But he just says, shh, shh, shh no. First, I'm not going to give you this ticket that you deserve. That, that would be mercy. And then secondly, here's a hundred bucks, which is a good thing that I don't deserve, right? And that would be grace. And, that, and that's the way that it was taught to me in Sunday school. Mercy is about forgiveness. Grace is about getting God's riches at Christ's expense. And, and those are great and those are true things. And that is absolutely part, part of what mercy is. Forgiveness. Not getting this bad thing that we deserve, but instead being forgiven. But there's another aspect to mercy as well. I, I like imagining mercy as a coin with two sides, and it's a coin that is meant to be given away. So on one side of this coin is forgiveness, which we've talked about, and, and, and that, that's part of what mercy means. But on the other side of this coin, and you can see this even in those texts that I mentioned, is giving or compassion, goodwill. So it's forgiving and it's giving. It's both this forgiveness concept as well as this goodwill and compassion concept. You see this in all of these where it connects God being merciful, yes, to his forgiveness, but also to his goodwill, towards his compassion, towards all, as it says in Psalm 145, to his goodness. Mercy forgives and it gives. If it helps you, when you hear the word mercy, hear also the word misery. So when someone is in misery of any kind, mercy is, is seeking to give or forgive that person, right? So if the misery is relational because two people have been in an argument or wounded each other in some way, mercy looks to alleviate that misery, that relational misery, but by moving towards the person with forgiveness. If the misery is financial, like there's somebody who's in some sort of financial need, and, and mercy sees that. Mercy wants to alleviate that by giving compassionately, by taking care of that person, by being generous with that person. So there's these two aspects to the mercy coin, forgiveness and this giving of compassion. Now, we know about mercy in our culture, and in some ways, in some ways, we sort of value mercy in our culture. But the truth is, we are fairly merciless as a culture, and so are they. So... Greek Roman culture at that time, they did not elevate mercy a as a virtue, really. Uh, uh, there, there was a god, a Greek god named mercy, but by Aristotle in the 300s and then the Stoics in the 200s, mercy a as a virtue had really fallen out of favor. In fact, it was seen basically as like sentimentality or, or weakness or pity. It was just something that you're like, you know, you should just allow people to face their own justice and everybody should pick themselves up by their own bootstraps sort of thing. It was not something that you were encouraged to give away necessarily. It was more or less a sign of weakness. It was, according to one Roman philosopher, the disease of the soul. Blessed are the bold in their culture, the courageous, those who exact strict justice and firm discipline. And Jesus said, no. Blessed are the merciful. They were merciless. Well, the reality is, so are we, kind of. Now, now, listen, in our culture, we're constantly being told to be merciful in a way, right? Like, we're told you need to you know, feed the hungry and save the puppies and care for the refugees and accept everybody for whatever they think they are and whoever they think they are and, and, and you know, say certain things and, and up, uplift the oppressed and all of these things which seem like kind of merciful and yet... In our culture, it doesn't take much to peel back the veneer of that and see real mercilessness, right? I mean, in our culture, if you say the wrong thing or if you don't say the right thing at the right time or if you eat the wrong thing or if you 
buy the wrong thing from the wrong company or if you think the wrong way or if you vote for the wrong person or whatever. If you do that, our culture right now is merciless, isn't it? I mean, you will be canceled, you'll be unfriended, you'll be sued, you'll be attacked viciously. I mean, it's like there's landmines everywhere in our culture just maiming people mercilessly right and left. So on one hand, our culture is like, oh yeah, yeah, we're all about mercy. And yet, if you look a little bit closer, we are maybe just as merciless as the Greeks and the Romans of old. I mean, I don't know if you've seen these instant karma videos. They're all over the place where somebody does something foolish or rude and then immediately something bad happens to them. Those things are so popular. We, we the people are the people of schadenfreude, right? That's the German word for taking delight in someone else's pain or misery, right? Schadenfreude. I mean, we, we sort of delight when we see a person get fired or get sick or get divorced or lose their money or whatever. We, we almost delight because they had it coming to them. We, we are, in a way, merciless. If you were to ask our culture what blessed is, it might say, blessed are the self-righteous. And Jesus said, uh, no. Blessed are the merciful. It was a statement of reality in his kingdom. And it was also an offer that Jesus was making to us. It was an offer to be mercy filled because you cannot be merciful if you have not been mercy filled. So what does it mean to be mercy filled? Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. If you have been filled with mercy, then you can and you should give mercy away. In Matthew 18, Jesus tells a story of a, a, of a servant who could have and should have given mercy away because he had been given much mercy. Maybe, maybe you're familiar with this story, maybe you're not, but in this story, this king's servant owed the king a great debt and the king one day going through his accounts realized, oh, this servant of mine, he owes me something akin to like $12 million, okay? Some impossible amount for this servant to pay back. And so the servant pleaded with this king for mercy and the king very unusually and very graciously said, okay, uh, I will give you mercy. I will forgive you this debt. I will be kind to you. I'll give you my kindness. And instead of putting you in prison, I will give you your freedom. And he let this servant go on. Well, not long thereafter, the servant happened upon someone else who owed him money, something akin to like 20 bucks. And instead of giving away the very kind of mercy that he had received, he was incredibly cruel and was beating up this other man who couldn't pay him back and did not give mercy even though he had been given mercy. It says in verse 28, but when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. There's your 20 bucks. He grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Despite the fact that he was forgiven and that he had received mercy, he did not give mercy mercy away. And the king eventually found this out and, and then exacted a, a type of justice on this man because of the man's mercilessness. Now, Jesus told this story, challenging them to forgive and to give mercy because they had been given mercy. You know, in that story, we are the servant who has been given great, much, uh, great mercy. We have been filled with God's mercy. So we ought to then give it away. Have you ever thought about the fact that we owe God in a, in a spiritual sense, we, we have a greater debt to God in a spiritual sense than $12 million? That, that we need the mercy of God's forgiveness to us? Have you, have you ever considered just, I'm not saying that you're not like a good person in a lot of metrics. I'm just saying, have you ever really looked deeply and thought about how selfish we can be and how off we can be in our souls? I don't know if you've read Augustine's Confessions, but when I read it, it reminds me of, of a parent going through their child's hair looking for little nits from lice. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. It's awful. Augustine's Confessions, read it. That's a great experience. This one, not great. But you like have to pick through and look for these tiny little egg things, these little lice, whatever, and you got to like pick out each one. Well, as you read Augustine's Confessions, it's as if he is taking a knit comb to his life. And even though many of us will look at him and go, that's a good guy, he recognized 
how often and how consistently he was sinning against God in his selfishness, in his wounding of other people, in his wrong-headed thoughts, in the way that he had embraced and just given in to certain temptations. He just went through with a fine-tooth comb in confession. We need forgiveness constantly, way more than $12 million worth. Not only that, not only do we need the mercy of God's forgiveness, but we need the mercy of God's goodness and compassion. God has blessed us in countless ways. I mean, God has, God has given us so many things that we just take for granted, right? There, there's so many blessings in our life that the sun shines today, that we woke up today, that we're breathing, that, that we know anything about him, that his word came down to us so that we could know him better. These blessings are so tremendously rich to us, including the promises of life eternal, that anything we do, even the good stuff we do, doesn't measure up. I mean, imagine that you were doing a, a, like a gift exchange during the Christmas season with a coworker, and you showed up, and they were really excited to give you the gift, and so you opened it, and what you saw was an account with a bunch of money in it for education, and it's to pay off your debt or help your kids or your grandkids or whoever go to college or something, and you're like, whoa, this is an incredible gift. How, how did you do this? And they said, well, I just downsized my house drastically and I took the equity out of my house so that I could set this money aside for you. Now, you might look at that. You would be so humbled that handing them that like $10 Panera card that you got, would, it, that would feel like an offense. Like even this good thing that you did is so overmatched, overwhelmed by their brilliance and kindness to you, even that good thing would be an offense. God in his mercy knows that we have like nothing to offer. Even the best thing we can offer is the Panera card, right? Like it's, it's very little in comparison to the greatness of his glory and his goodness. Our sin required Jesus, the very son of God, to come and to offer his life as a sacrifice to satisfy the wrath of God. He is the great king who took on that debt on himself, who took on those wounds, who took on our sin, who took on death so that we might live and walk in his way. Our God is rich in mercy toward us. Ephesians 2 again, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you've been saved. If we accept the mercy of God, we are mercy filled. We are so filled with God's mercy. We could never give it all away. There was a movie in the 80s called Brewster's Millions where this man who never uh, had a lot of money, somehow he was set to inherit this vast fortune. I don't know, like hundreds of millions of dollars or something. I don't remember the exact numbers. But he was in order to get those hundreds of millions of dollars, he had to spend $30 million in 30 days. He couldn't give it away. He couldn't gamble it away. He just had to spend it. Now, I don't remember if this movie is inappropriate. It was a long time ago. This does not get the pastoral seal of approval, okay? But here's what I remember about the film. Some of us think, oh, $30 million, I could spend it like that. And, and maybe you could. Congratulations. But in the movie, he had a hard time spending that much money in that short of time. Yeah, he got a luxury apartment and he got this big personal staff and he wore fancy clothes. But a lot of times he would buy something and then it would turn into an investment. So then it was like worth more than he spent money on. Or he would give a lavish gift only for that person to give a lavish gift back to him. And so he was really struggling to, to spend it all up. And even if he could spend it up, in the end, he was going to get more money. Mercy is like that. If it's a coin meant to be given away, we can't outspend God's mercy. We've been so filled with his mercy that we can be so fully giving to others of mercy and we will never run out. Even if we feel like we run out of mercy sometimes, God's mercies are new every morning. We are independently wealthy in mercy. We are mercy filled so that we might be merciful. We the people of mercy. 
So what is mercy? Well, we said there's two sides to it, forgiving and giving. Mercy filled. Are you mercy filled? Do you know what Christ has done for you? If so, then you have been filled with the mercies of God. So then, how can we be merciful towards others? How, how can we act this out in our world and in our lives? Over the years, the Catholic Church came up with what they called their, their works of mercy, and they kind of have them divided into sort of spiritual works of mercy and kind of more practical, for lack of a better term, uh, 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 works of mercy. And there's a, there's a kind of a chart out there that you can find. And that might be helpful to you. And I looked at it and I was like, yeah, hey, it's kind of helpful. Um, but I actually found it more helpful to look at how merciful the early church was. To specifically look at what did they do in that Roman first, you know, a couple centuries uh, AD culture that distinguished them. How, they were a people that was so sure that the mercy of God had been given to them, how then did they live that out in their daily lives? Well, well, there's a few things that we can see in the book of Acts and in other historical documents that we can see that the early church did. They were incredibly merciful to their enemies. We see the early church being merciful to their enemies, forgiving the very people that were coming after them to persecute them. There's no more famous version of this than in Acts 7, where the very first martyr in the church named Stephen, where he was being killed, and he said the same words essentially as Jesus in the midst of his being stoned. In Acts 7, Stephen prayed and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he had fallen asleep. The early church was merciful to their enemies. The early church was also merciful to those who had financial needs. We see this also in Acts, right? In, in Acts 2, they, they were sharing everything in common. There was none among them who, who had any needs because they wanted to give. They wanted to step into arenas of misery and give mercy. They, they, if they saw somebody who couldn't eat or was struggling, they came alongside of them and they met their needs we see this not just in Acts. There's actually other uh, historical documents that, that talk about this as well. The Roman Emperor Julian, writing in the 4th century, he regretted the pro progress of Christianity. So this is a few hundred years after the book of Acts was written because it had pulled people away from the Roman gods. And he said this, It's a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans, now he called Christians godless, which we can talk about that some other time, but the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for help, that we should render them. So he said, it's, of course they're growing because they're taking care of the poor, their own poor and other poor. They're just giving away mercy. The early church was merciful towards their enemies, merciful towards those in financial need. They were merciful to widows and children. In Acts, we see how the early church was trying to grapple with, there's all these widows, and there were orphans and, and children as well in great need. They were extremely vulnerable. They, would, they had been forced, many of them, into to begging and, and to other worse things in order to make ends meet, in order to eat. And the early church was not willing to just sit by or stand by and allow this stuff to happen. They were so convinced that God had mercifully protected them and called them, although they were spiritual orphans, into God's loving family, that they wanted to step toward the vulnerable in their communities and to help them. So we saw that in Acts 6 as they took care of the widows. We also see it elsewhere in historical documents that the early church, they were the only ones that was speaking out or that were speaking out against mistreatment of children. Uh, in one of the cases in the Roman Empire, infants who were unwanted were left outside and exposed to the elements to just die by, by various people in Rome and or that those children would then be taken and turned into slaves by people. The only community in ancient Rome that was calling out this, that sort of injustice were the Christians. It was the early church that set up and said, no, none of you ever be part of exposing your infant or leaving them to die. And they spoke out against the Roman government. They also went another step further. So they spoke out against mistreatment of the children and the death of infants, but they also were adopting children. Uh, J.T. Fitzgerald, a professor of theology at Notre Dame, he writes about this and he says, early Christians made a variety of responses both as individuals and as an institution, 
Of the responses by individuals, adoption was the most significant one, and it was encouraged by church leaders. So the early church, they showed mercy to the vulnerable children, the infants, the widows, because they were so convinced of God's mercy to them. They also, the early church, showed mercy to the dying. They were merciful to those that were dying. Various plagues swept through the Roman Empire, and, and there, was, there were very few people who were willing to care for those that were dying from, from the various plagues. And there were even fewer people willing to then handle the dead bodies who had died from the plagues. And yet there were Christians. There were Christians who came along and cared for those dying people, who nursed, tried to nurse them back to health, and it cost some of those Christians their lives. There were Christians that buried the dead for the families who were distraught and gave services for those families so that they might, they might be able to grieve properly their lost loved ones. Many who nursed others to health died themselves. They would take up the bodies of the saints, close their eyes, shut their mouths, carry them on their shoulders. They would embrace them, wash and dress them in burial clothes, and soon receive the same services themselves. Dionysius, the bishop of Alexandria, talked about how Christians showed mercy to the dying. When nobody else would serve the dying or bear the dead, the Christians did. In the midst of squalor, misery, illness, the anonymity of ancient cities, Christianity provided an island of mercy and security. The truly revolutionary principle was that Christian love and charity must extend beyond the boundaries of family and even those of the faith to all in need. For the early church that was so convinced that they were filled with the mercy of God, they were incredibly merciful to these populations of people and these vulnerable people. How can we then be merciful people also? If we too have been filled with the mercy of Christ, how can we then give that away? That kind of forgiveness, that sort of compassion and generosity to other people. Well, here's a few things that we could do even this week. First, we can start with the mirror. Well, what I mean is nobody needs or has been given more mercy than this guy, than, than you. Every day it would probably be a very helpful habit if we woke up in the morning and we said, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. To, to just look in the mirror and recognize whether it's by reading this parable of the unmerciful servant or, or some other of the text that we mentioned earlier, just recognizing that God has given us so much mercy and forgiveness and in the blessings that we do not deserve. Start with the mirror if you want to be merciful. Second, if you want to be merciful, pray and forgive. Pray and forgive. I don't know if there's anybody uh, who you can point to who's like an enemy of yours or something, like in, a, in, in as pronounced of a way as, this, as the early church, right? Like there's not maybe a person who you could say, Father, forgive them in the same way that Stephen could. But there are people with whom we've had conflict. There are people with whom we've struggled. There are people who who just really get under our skin. And maybe, again, maybe this goes back to that peacemaking we talked about a couple weeks ago. There are people we've tried to reconcile with and they simply will not do it. Ask God to help you forgive that person. Pray that you would learn to forgive 70 times seven. That, that friend who misunderstood you and will not return your call. That romantic partner that betrayed you. That, that, that parent that let you down. Pray that God would help you become merciful in forgiving even those who have wounded you. Start with the mirror. Pray and forgive. Third, slow down for mercy. Slow down for mercy. This is another thing we can do this week. I've mentioned this before, but one of the social psychology experiments that, that always has stuck with me, it was done in the 70s. No, I, didn't, I wasn't part of the study back then, but uh, it, it was done in the 70s to Princeton Seminary grads. Or, or to students rather, seminary students. And basically what happened was these students came in and they were told to either read the story of the Good Samaritan or to read these pamphlets on postgraduate careers or something like that. And then after they read those things, they were then told, oh, you have to go across campus and you have to meet with this person to talk about postgraduate careers and kind of placement and all of that. Now to some of the people, some of whom read the Good Samaritan and some of whom read this other material, uh, they, they said, 
oh, you got plenty of time to get over there. Here's a map, you know, you, you have plenty of time, just head on over to the other side of campus. To others of the people from both categories, they said, oh, you're, we're running a little bit late. You gotta hurry over to the other side of campus to go have this conversation. Well, they gave everybody a map, and on the way to the other side of the campus, they had stationed an actor who was kind of in an alleyway and had their head down, and right as the person would come by, they were kind of slumped over. They'd start to kind of cough and not really move or anything. And then they recorded the reactions of the seminary students to see, like, does it make a difference what they read ahead of time? You know, like, what changes how these students respond? It was the Good Samaritan story, a story that talks very clearly about mercy. In fact, the guy who asked Jesus about the story at the end, he's like, well, the one who had mercy, the, the, the good Samaritan, that was the guy who was acting the right way. Well, they recorded all these seminarians' responses, and what they found was this. The strongest predictor for whether or not someone would show actual mercy, to be merciful to somebody who seemingly was in need, was whether or not they had been told they had lots of time or no time to get to the other, the other side of campus. Essentially, whether that person felt really busy and frazzled and late and distracted getting somewhere, or whether the person was looking around and paying attention at what was happening around them. That was the number one predictor of how merciful those people turned out to be. Slow down for mercy. In, in our world, slowing down for mercy might mean putting down our phones and actually looking someone in the eye for a conversation. For us, slowing down for mercy might be asking a second question of, the, of our coworker instead of just, how was your weekend? But like actually going another layer deeper. For us, slowing down might be starting our days asking God, God, to whom are you calling me to be merciful this week? It means that we put ourselves in a mindset and we slow the pace of our distractions so that we can actually see the coughing person in the corner. I remember listening to a talk by Brian Stevenson, lawyer, author of, of Just Mercy, among other books. And, and he said one of the biggest things, the, the largest gap between those who would be merciful and those who are actually merciful is proximity. It, it's simply that many of us are insulated, we're too busy, we're too distracted, we're too caught up in our own little comfortable worlds that we don't see the very real misery that needs mercy. So may we slow down so that we might, those of us who are mercy-filled, be merciful. Last thing I would say for us to be merciful is to put your money where your mercy is. Put your money where your mercy is. What I mean is, maybe when you heard the, uh, the, the history of the early church and how they were responding to, to those that were in need and the vulnerable. Maybe, maybe if you're like me, you're thinking, man, I love that. I love that they were showing mercy to those that were in financial need or those affected by the pandemic. I love that they called out the injustice towards, towards infants and, and orphans. I, I love that. I just love that they were so active in, in like being engaged in the very real problems in their culture. I remember uh, being a younger person listening and even talking to other folks about, man, why, why, the early church was so awesome. They did all this stuff so, so well. They were so merciful and we're so not. You know, they were so engaged in their communities. And we, my church is so, and like I got kind of like all sort of maybe a little self-righteous potentially about how, why isn't my church, why aren't our churches, you know, more merciful? Now, partly, the reason why I think I was like, why isn't my church more merciful? Is I just didn't understand what my church was already doing. I, I didn't see all the ways that my church was engaged in very real ways of you know, prison ministry and adoption ministries and, and helping single mothers and, and all of these things that are very real mercy ministries. I just didn't know that. So part of it was just ignorance. But there was something else that I was missing when I was blaming my church, I guess, for, for, for not being more merciful. And the thing that I was missing that was kind of a really big deal was that I am the church. You are the, like, as an individual, I am the church. I don't need to wait for programs. I don't, I don't need to wait for a whole bunch of people, for a groundswell of a thing to happen over there that I can then go be part of. God's calling me to be merciful right 
where I am, right? With the people that are around me. So I need to put my money where my mouth is. Yes. Yeah, sure, I should vote, right? Like, and we're going to vote for the person that we feel that we should vote for. But instead of just bashing people that vote a different way, what if this election season we did more than just vote, but we were actually truly merciful to the vulnerable people around us? Well, what do I mean? Well, you could volunteer. Volunteering is kind of hard right now, but it, you could potentially volunteer, and we've, we've putting out some resources about that in some different uh, venues. But you could also give. What, again, like very literally, what if we put our money where our mercy was? I thought of this idea, and I, maybe it's crazy, but maybe you'll join me. This 2020 mercy idea. What if we gave 2020 away? What do I mean? Well, what if we gave $2 and two cents, because that makes sense for some of us. That's 2020, right? In a manner of speaking. What if we gave $2 and two cents to some ministry of mercy or to, to some vulnerable population or group or ministry that we feel strongly about? Or, or what if we gave $20 and 20 cents away? Or what if we gave $202 away or $2,020 or, or $20,200, I'm going to lose it pretty soon, but like what if we like looked in 2020 to do more than just vote and more than just talk about stuff, but we actually put our time, our effort, our talents, our money where our mercy is. I mean, that would be powerful if we, those of us that are mercy filled would actually be tangibly merciful in the ways that God's called us. Listen, we're all passionate about a lot of the same things. We all want to see the refugee taken care of and the single mother taken care of. And we all are like passionate about the unborn and all of these things that we feel very passionate. But where is God calling you as an individual to be merciful? Could we take on this 2020 challenge together in some way? We, those of us who have been merciful, are called to be merciful. The, the Holy Spirit used the early church, a bunch of nobodies with very little resources, and used them to just simply be merciful, despite corrupt emperors and all kinds of stuff, to change the world. What could God do through our mercy that we give away? Do you know how the violence of the gladiator games ended? I start off by saying that the gladiator games could end and a person would wave a hanky or do this. or uh, We were not exactly sure of the symbols, but we know how an individual game could end. But do you know how the games as a whole came to an end? Well, it came to an end with a cry for mercy. In 370 AD, without warning, at the height of the celebration of, the Roman, uh, of a Roman victory over the Goths, uh, there was this grand gladiator game sort of celebration that was happening. And this one man, his name was Telemachus, uh, he was kind of this weather-beaten, kind of tough, surly-looking character, came down, and he was a Christian, and he simply couldn't watch this violence and this misery and this kind of sick game happening before him, and he couldn't handle it. And so he jumped over the rail and went down onto the very pitch along with the two warriors. And it was a single combat that was happening between two, two men. And he literally placed himself between the two combatants. And he said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, I command these wicked games to cease. Do not requite God's mercy by shedding innocent blood. Well, for a moment, the crowd was really silent. But it didn't take long for the, the crowd to start jeering and throwing fruit, and even for one of the, the gladiators to step forward and to kill the man who had placed himself between them. Only when he killed the man, he was probably expecting the crowd to erupt in cheers, but they got even quieter than they had been before, and slowly they began to filter their way out of the games. That's how the gladiator games ended, as a hero calling for mercy, sunk to his knees, in death. He gave up his life in some sense so that they would see and understand God's mercy. Jesus came down to us, a people embroiled in games and, and violence and selfishness and misery. And Jesus offered us true mercy. He offered us his life. Let's close with this word from Titus 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, 
disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we are so filled with your mercy. We don't deserve it. It's not by our righteousness. It's by yours that Jesus might come down to the blood and the mire of our lives, the darkest, deepest, nastiest corners of our hearts, the games that we play, the lies we tell ourselves and others, the insults that we hurl. He came right down there showing us and offering us mercy. May we be filled with a sense of your mercy toward us, and may we then give that mercy away, knowing that your mercies are new every morning. We can't run out. God, you're so good. Make us, we the people, be a merciful people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.